What do you want from us? But what if this is a nightmare? You really scared me. That's what you wanted. Is that what you wanted? No. What do you want? Your blood. All over me. Sergeant Sacker, listen to me. We've traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. Our squad car's going over there right now. Just get out of that house. I want you to be my friend. <laughs> This audience is watching what the film critic for After Dark magazine has called the most terrifying movie I have ever seen. Leave me alone! Jill, we trace the call. It's coming from inside the house. Just get out of that house. Every babysitter's nightmare becomes real when a stranger calls. Hi, I'm Barbara Crampton from Chopping Mall, and you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to, this time it's episode 268, and we're going back to one of the OG slashers. Is it a slasher? Well, it remains to be seen. Certainly slasher adjacent. Uh, one of the first out of the stable after John Coppens Halloween. Uh, the original When a Stranger Calls from 1979. So this is my choice. Um, I've been trying to think of a Susan the Banshee song I can play out with, but Eric will be pleased to know I'm not playing out with Susan the Banshees this time. Wow, what a change. <laughs> oh, thank Finally. you, Eric. Yeah, it's probably the creatures, is it? No, it's not. You're so magnanimous, Eric, in defeat, as usual. Um, but, yes, we are covering When a Stranger Calls. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting one to cover. Uh, say it's a film, as I mentioned, came out and did big box office and helped to kind of uh, cement the subgenre as a, a box office entity in the late 70s, early 1980s. Uh, and also, uh, done some digging into the background of the urban legend of the the babysitter in the house inside the house when the the killer's upstairs. Uh, so yeah, going to be lots to talk about. But before we do that, um, let's see how we're all doing. So Eric, what would you like to be covered in? I was thinking Twixes or maybe Galaxy Caramel, but I'm not bendy enough to lick it all off every orifice, though. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yes, that's a that's an image I'm not going to forget quickly. So, well, I'm you're glad welcome. to hear you're. D- yeah, that's very well, thank you, uh, Nathan. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Just uh, hanging out at home, hoping a stranger don't call. Well, have you ever had any prank calls? No, I've made them. Have you? Yeah, I called my grandmother once and disguised my voice and claimed that I wanted her to purchase some Tupperware. And my grandmother's super nice. So um, she was trying to politely say no, and I wouldn't let her until I got her very frustrated. And then I told her it was me. Mm. And what did she say to that? That she was going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of the roles were reversed. Yeah. Wow. She was going to kinda... kill the prank caller. <gasps> wow. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you, Nathan. And Joseph, uh, have you ever had any dirty calls or made any yourself? Uh, I plead the fifth on that one. Oh, okay. (gasps) Fair enough. Well, I had, uh, I I did one time when I was a kid, I remember we, we, um, we phoned, we uh, very expensively phoned the United States and did prank calls from our house in Guildford in in the UK in the late 1970s. So it must oh, have cost a fortune. Mm. <laughs> Did your parents not say anything when they saw the bill? I can't remember what happened. I don't think we saw them very long. We just kind of, we were just sort of, we just got someone to answer and then said something silly down the phone and put the phone down. But uh, but yes, telephones as a instrument of terror, which of course is a long-standing um, uh, kind of genre trope, isn't it? All the way back from, well, I think it's probably... Because uh, there was a telephone, wasn't there? Mario Bava, um, was it called the phone? The one in the with the Black Sabbath, 
the um, the one with the drip, the, the drop of water, um, and then right up to scream and all the way through. So yeah, so when a stranger calls, it's going to be an interesting one to talk about. But before we do that, um, let's see what we've been watching recently. So Eric, have you seen anything you want to tell us about? No. No, I know we're we're basically. I mean, Eric's quite used to cramming them in, but um, we are having to cram them in because we um, we do have some holidays coming up. Uh, so we are sort of getting as much recorded as we possibly can in advance, uh, just so we don't fall behind. So, um, Eric, are you you happy with cramming them in? Is it something you're looking forward to doing that on holiday? If you mean vodka and tonics and chunky Kit Kats, then yes. It's the only cramming in I get to do these days. Oh, oh, poor Eric. How sad. Anyway, um, Nathan, have you seen anything on Tell Us About? I watched Orphan First Kill. Oh, I did see that. Sorry. And so did I. Yes. So did I. <laughs> okay, then we can all discuss it then. Yeah. So I guess, what what did you guys think of it? I loved it. I thought it was totally silly and really ridiculous. I especially, I mean, I know that they were, you know, trying to... Yeah, and they did a good job, you know, with up close shots of um, what, what's her name, Isabel Furman? Is that her name? Yes, I think, I think so. Yeah. When they did the far away shots, I'm just like, that is so not her. It's just it was it was so obvious, but it didn't matter because I thought this movie was unbelievably entertaining. It was totally ridiculous in spots, but it took me by surprise a few times, and I just loved it. I thought it was really entertaining. Have you been taken by surprise many times, Nathan? Um, no, no, no. Usually I'm expecting. <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> uh, you so, a little trollop. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, Eric, what did you think of Orphan First Kill? I bloody well loved it. I thought it was just hugely entertaining. As Nathan said, really stupid. I thought they did something clever slash really far-fetched and stupid uh, halfway through the film that uh, I didn't see coming. And... I thought it was, to me, it was very much along the lines of something like Shattered, which we discussed, I think, on the Patreon, um, at one, on a Patreon episode last year. It just had that, that ludicrous kind of um, from hell type feel to it because, uh, you know, it, it takes something to sort of uh, one up the twist they had in the first Orphan. And uh, they they managed to go real Scooby Doo with this one. I just thought it was deliciously entertaining, and uh, I'm I, I I don't know what the reviews are f- f- from the mainstream critics, but I imagine they hate it. But I thought it was great. Excellent. And Joseph, how about you? Yeah, I mean, if you've seen the OG film and remember its big twist, um, you're right to express even a little skepticism at a prequel made and released 13 years later. But um, I was actually shocked at how well they managed to, uh, and I'm trying to be vague with spoilers here, let's say hide certain aspects of certain characters uh, to the point where it's not necessarily believable, but it is admirable. Um, I mean, again, if you've seen the first film, you're not getting much you haven't already seen before. Uh, Essentially, Esther's murderous origins are laying bare for all to see. So there's lots of the little tyke, and I put that in quotation marks, uh, running around killing people. I think the biggest question on a lot of people's minds is, do they match the ridiculousness of that first film's twist? And that's probably where Orphan First Kill shines for me. The twist here is every bit as unbelievable and ridiculous as the reveal from the first film. And is probably the, the, the sole reason to invest yourself into first kill, which is, you know, it's not a bad movie. I was very entertained, but it's more of the same, honestly. Um, you know, that may or may not be a good thing depending on the viewer, but I enjoyed it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I, I concur. I thought it was uh, a lot of fun. I did think it was going to be, I mean, sometimes you get sequels to movies or prequels where they, they just regurgitate the first movie just with like a different cast, which of course we all love when we see maybe a Friday 13th movie, but with this, um, I, it did feel like it was going to go very much down the route of the first film with Esther ending up with a family and then killing them off one by one. And you kind of knew it kind of um, ended badly from the, the first film. And obviously, it's a prequel. But I did appreciate the fact that they threw that kind of sidewinder twist in halfway through which I thought was uh, was kind of very clever. I mean, the only thing that I could not, didn't like about it was the fact that it, it kind of looked like it was uh, sort of filmed through a, a fishbowl. Yeah, I was thinking the same. 
I kept on thinking, is this, have I got a bad copy of this? Is it, is this what it's meant to look like? Or is it, cause it looked really smudgy. I don't know if they I think go- it was meant to look like that because they're yeah. trying to hide Esther. Um, well, spoiler alert, they're trying to obfuscate some of her features. Yeah. I kind of guess that I wondered if they're going to go for a slightly sepia look cause it could be a prequel perhaps. But uh, yeah, it was a, I, it was a lot of fun. So um, yeah, it, I say especially once it changed things up a little bit, but then kind of satisfied, uh, you know, like when, where you kind of expected it to, but in a way that you weren't expecting it. To where how to get there? I kind of guess the, the what I'm looking for there. But uh, yeah, so if you haven't seen that, then I would do it definitely is a good a recommend from us. So um, I'm not quite sure how unless they do another prequel, how they could really bring Esther back. But uh, I've seen people calling for Esther versus Chucky, Esther versus Michael <laughs> Myers. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Because ever, as anyone Esther knows... Esther versus who, Predator. <laughs> yes, anyone who knows is with horror movie matchups, it doesn't really matter if someone died in the previous film or the film before that. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so good. And so I, I can't remember, that was that to you, Nathan, wasn't it? I was wondering, is anything else you've seen? No, that was the only one I saw this time around. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, Joseph, how about you? Yeah, I saw um, Orphan First Kill. Have you guys seen that? Mm. Oh, I did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, um, yeah, that's all I've seen this week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I kind of funny enough, well, not funny enough, I, uh, talking about watching movies, I just, I'm about half, well, two thirds of the way through Nope, the Jordan Peele movie. And uh, so we decided to record a little bit earlier today, which is fine. It's all good. But I'm about two thirds of the way through. Have you, have you guys seen it? Yes. Hmm. I want to. What What did you think, uh, Eric? Um, I liked it for the most part, but uh, I just, I don't know. It, it felt like, quote, elevated horror or elevated sci-fi is probably in the, is more apt um so it, it i don't know kind of felt to me like um they're looking down on the sci-fi genre even though i know he's not he's a big fan but yeah i didn't get from it what i was hoping for for but maybe a second viewing is is necessary what what are your thoughts so far that you're two thirds the way through? Yeah, I'm in, enjoying it. I mean, also kind of, I, I, it kind of, I, it reminds me of a certain film which I won't say on air because uh, it gives it all away. Um, but uh, say so I'm about two thirds of the way through, so uh, we'll return to it after we've done this. But uh, yeah, I'm mean, enjoying it. It's kind of, I don't know. I'm kind of, I, I kind of liked. Um, I, I felt his two previous films were maybe slightly better paced. I think you can you kind of get to a point, don't you, when you're thinking, does it really need to be two hours, 15 minutes long? Exactly. And I, I felt the two lead characters were kind of uh, unengaging in a way. I didn't mind them too much, but I just thought, I just don't, don't know. It's kind of, I think they could be, you know, he's obviously very talented, Jordan Peele, as a director. But I think there's sometimes you might listen to your own hype and then thinking, I, I really need, you know, my films need to be over two hours long. And there's not really enough sort of, he almost, I mean, he almost falls into that Quentin Tarantino-esque thing of having these kind of, these kind of little kind of side story things, which don't really drive the story forward, but give it, give it kind of flavor, um, which I'm not necessarily against, but when you're making a horror thriller, sci-fi sort of movie, is that the right kind of thing to do with it? I don't know. I'd like you say I need to finish it and maybe have a think about it. But uh, yeah, it looks stunning, though. I will give it that. Mm. It has the look and feel of uh, well, people are saying a western. The the look and feel I get is of Tremors because it's set in mm. that kind of um, deserty landscape, and it looks absolutely stunning. And uh, there's some great shots in it that you could like take a still image from and hang in an art gallery um, I would definitely like to watch it again people are saying it deserves a second watch to really sort of embrace it um, to embrace it really but uh, mm. yeah well I'll do that when I come back from my holidays maybe but uh, the first the first one left me I didn't wasn't puzzled by it I was just like a bit long characters unengaging oh stop it you um, uh, yeah and I was, I was expecting more from it. people are saying, oh, it's a UFO movie. That's not really a UFO movie. And I thought there was going to be some spectacular twist to it that uh, doesn't happen. Well, interestingly, I mean, uh, talking of uh, deserving a second time watch, have you rewatched The Newly Dead since we recorded the, uh, the episode? No. Why? No, I just wondered if it was deserving of a second watch. Well, I, I probably did watch it twice in the lead up to that podcast. So it would be a third watch I'd be giving it. Mm. 
Third time's the charm. And incidentally, if Hysteria Lives Facebook page goes down, as it were, um, I did get a warning on Facebook because I put a clip from the Newly Deads where to completely cover, well, not covered, but like a couple are making out and get get killed. But there's no boobage or anything like that. But I got a warning from Facebook that I basically was publishing Bukaki or something. And um, if I didn't take it down, they would ban me from Facebook. So they said, and then they left it up anyway. So I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's still there. It's still there. Well, yeah, if Hysteria Lives goes offline, then I've been uh, arrested by the Facebook police for just putting some sort of a very mild, not even nudity, sort of a, a making out scene with a murder, uh, sort of very cheesy murder. So anyway, thank you for keeping a safe Facebook and protecting the children. So at least someone checked on the children. Um, and Joseph, have you seen Nope? Nope. Nope. Okay. Well, talking, well, that was, I haven't seen anything else again, because we are, as we said, Eric cramming them in, um, because we have to, we've got, uh, I have the unenviable choice of trying to choose two from, three from 2005, um, which possibly is the most fallow year I've come across so far, but uh, I'm sure I'll manage it. So, yeah, so we're trying to watch, uh, probably watch lots of movies 2005, so we can talk about them over on Patreon. And of course, talking of Patreon, uh, well, our, our Friday the 13th episode will be out with a fan commentary, Joseph. Yes, when you're hearing this right now, that episode would have already have landed. So, hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with that one recording Prom Night next. So, and again, that's going to be a, a, a lot of fun talking about, well, obviously Prom Night, also uh, disco music, uh, the uh, Disco Sucks movement, all sorts of things like that. It's going to be a, a good a good fun time. So, yeah, join us over on Patreon for those. But uh, we're keeping it free and easy here on The History Continues. And so let's go into the main uh, attraction, which is uh, When a Stranger Calls. So uh, up first is uh, the cinema trailer for the film. And then I'll come back in after this. On a warm September evening. Dr. Malakis? Jill Johnson was babysitting for the two young children of a wealthy doctor. Okay. Bye. They told her where they would be and when they would be home. They told her everything she had to know, except what to do when a stranger calls. Hello? Have you checked the children? What? Hello, could you get me the police? Well, there's really nothing you can do about it down here. Uh, Have you checked the children? He's watching me through the windows. Well, if he calls again, we can try to trace it. Why haven't you checked the children? Please, can't you help me? I'm all alone here. What do you want? Your blood. Leave me alone! Jill, this is Sergeant Sacker. We've traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. Jill, just get out of that house. And the terror just begins when a stranger calls. During an evening of babysitting, high school student Jill Johnson is terrorised by a caller who keeps asking, have you checked the children? When she calls the police, they inform her that the calls are coming from inside the house. So, yes, when a stranger calls, um, it's, uh, it's a film that I kind of remember from way, way back when. Obviously, I was much too young to see it at the cinema. But I do remember the video box uh, being our uh, local rental stores and also it having a reputation um, as being one of the scariest movies ever made. Uh, and obviously, that's something that they said on all the um, all the film posters as well. Uh, so it's it's kind of an odd film in so much that it's not exactly a film you either love or loathe. But I know most people uh, would agree the first twenty minutes um, is a kind of masterclass in suspense, where you have Carol Kane as the the babysitter uh, in alone in the house who are receiving these phone calls from someone who she presumes is outside and a threat is outside um, but uh, when the police eventually help her and manage she managed to keep the phantom caller on the line for long enough the police inform her the calls are coming from inside the house uh, and uh, she escapes um, with her life although 
you find out that the, the the killer has murdered horrifically murdered the children although you don't see this and in fact actually there's a film it's not really graphic at all in there's i'm not sure if there's even any blood in the movie or very little blood uh so a lot of it's left to suggestion um where the film divides people um myself included i can guess is the is the the um the middle uh, the filling of the sandwich which is this kind of manhunt um, where you have the cop who who uh, rescues Jill at the beginning of the movie uh, goes after the killer who, of course, in the grand late 70s, early 80s tradition has just escaped from the asylum and is on the run. Um, and the killer played by Tony, I think it's Tony Beckley, the kind of English actor, uh, he is... Um, so you have this kind of strange kind of character piece where you have this Tony Beckley kind of character who's almost trying to make good and befriend people uh, at a local bar. Um, and uh, But he's becoming more and more unhinged and he's being chased. Uh, and of course, at the end of the movie... Uh, sort of spoiling it, but this is you get the kind of the the uh, the uh, conclusion where he does track down Carol Kane's character, and uh, you know there's a great scene where she thinks her husband's in bed next to her, and it turns around it's actually the killer. Um, and but as a as a film that came out post Halloween, and this came out in October of 1979, so the Halloween season of 1979. Um, and we're obviously talking more about it in uh, in the the background, but it was picked up by Columbia, um, a made studio as from a kind of independently produced movie, just like Halloween. Well, although Halloween wasn't picked up uh, by a major studio, but Columbia picked this up and released it to screens and made a lot of money. Uh, and so, what is strange about the movie is that um, quite often you see online um, that, that people say that. Uh, the director uh, Fred Ward made made this uh, as a kind of cash in on Halloween, and in fact, that wasn't the case at all. Um, it went into production uh, in late October, well, no, early October 1978, just as Halloween, um, you know, was kind of in the, being released. But the film was very much based an expansion on his earlier short movie, The Sitter, which uh, is kind of a shot. It was made remade shot for shot by in this movie. And we talk about how that came about and also the inspirations behind uh, uh, that movie. I mean, for me, I'm going to come to you guys and see what you think. I kind of, I've always liked that kind of in that, the middle section, I always thought it was quite interesting. Having said that, rewatch it again today, uh, just to sort of re-get my bearings on the movie, it doesn't quite fit. I still think it's a bit. It's it seems a bit awkward. I, the killer's character goes from being this raving lunatic who will, you know, rip apart children with his bare hands, escapes an asylum, goes becomes a bit of a sad sack kind of hobo for most of the movie, and then goes back to a raving lunatic at the end of the movie. It kind of doesn't quite gel for me re-watching it as much as I appreciate in the kind of character study and also some of the other um there's the character actors in the movie uh but yeah I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about it so Nathan what are your thoughts on the original When a Stranger Calls well um like you were saying of course the opening is fantastic and Carol Kane is amazing in that scene it's one of the most unforgettable horror sequences I would say in horror history and um you know that's uh that's pretty awesome. Um, I guess for me, the middle part, I know that, like you said, it really divides people, the the middle part. And I guess for me, it's, it, and you finally, uh, or you uh, actually said what I've been trying to think about my issue with the middle part was, is that I actually don't mind it. I don't find it to be crazy boring or anything, but I do find that it's very odd compared to the beginning it, it it's like a total like shift and it just doesn't quite work for me um <clears throat> i think that i would have you know i guess i probably would have preferred more of a straightforward um you know when he got out he goes after carol kane i realized that's not this movie you know it tried to go in a direction of him i guess kind of redeeming himself and um, like you said, the character study is great. I think Colleen Dewhurst is amazing uh, as the woman that he kind of starts stalking. Um, that's all great. But yeah, it just it feels like you've got this horror movie, crime thriller, horror movie. Um, it's just kind of how it feels. It just feels a little disjointed to me. Um, but 
I mean, that doesn't make it a bad movie whatsoever. I think it's a great movie, um, and I don't find it boring whatsoever. Um, I do love the ending with um, you know the killer basically being in the bed next to her, although I never quite understood – um, if he was a ventriloquist or something, because, you know, she's laying in bed and staring at the closet and he starts whispering to her. But I just feel like if that was coming from the person laying right next to you, that you would know it unless he could throw his voice. Does that make sense? Well, at least he didn't put his uh, hands up his skirt and make a lips move. Ew. Justin. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's a joke from uh, Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. So, so I blame uh, Linda LaHughes for that one. Um but, uh, well, thank you, Nathan. I mean, sorry, I think I'm, I called um, the director Fred Ward. I meant Fred you Wharton, did. of course. Yes. Uh, so my a little, my tongue tied there. But I, isn't there, there's a scene, isn't there, of a ventriloquist dummy in the, um, in the sequel? Yeah, because they think that there's two of them, but then they kind of determine that he's, you know, just one and he can throw his voice. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, it's, it is, I just find it, it's rewatching it now. I just find it, it's kind of a bit of an awkward mix that he, uh, you know, he, there's no, no, it's, if they had this thing going through the middle of the movie that he was hunting her, it might be slightly different, but there was no indication, was there, all the way through the movie that he was after her. That's my biggest issue is that Carol Kane for the middle part of the movie is non-existent. Um, she doesn't really show up until towards the end for the big, you know, climactic scene. And then, of course, she's in the beginning. But, yeah, there's just nothing to do with her in the middle. And I guess I just wanted to see, you know, more of her character. Yeah, I I do wonder, actually, with Fred Walton, whether or not he would have gone, but if, you know, in, in retrospect, I'm sure this movie, if it really had been inspired by Halloween, he would have made a different movie. Um, so, uh, but we can talk more about those kind of uh, the, the, the plus and shortcomings in the movie. But Eric, what's, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I'm going to reiterate, reiterate even what you guys were saying. I like, I do quite like When a Stranger Calls, although to me, as you said, it has a very odd structure that makes it feel almost like an anthology. It, it feels to me like, um, three separate movies. You've got the opening with Carol Kane, then you've got that midsection with, uh, Charles Durnin, uh, which feels like a different film altogether, and then it returns to Carol Kane for what is feels like a sequel to the um, opening twenty minutes. So it has that kind of anthology feel. Um, it, I just find it odd the way that Carol Kane's character is dispensed for forty minutes or so. Although you could uh, say that Halloween kills that. Yeah, with Halloween kills does the same thing with Jamie Lee Curtis, where she's sort of pushed to the sidelines for long stretches of the film. Um, and I was thinking like something like Death Proof does that as well by just dispensing with characters halfway through and then moving on to something else. Um, so it's not a problem as such. I like That midsection I do like, as you were saying, I just feel that it just feels like we're suddenly in a completely different film with un totally unrelated characters all of a sudden. Um, the opening scene is good, but I think Black Christmas did it better with the call coming from inside the house shtick. Um, Carol Kane possibly deserved to be killed because she had her feet up on the sofa with her shoes on in someone else's house. Now, I don't know if that... What else... What other reason does the killer need to attack this woman that she has shoes on the couch? Oh, my God. Well, I mean, um, he has no room to talk. He got blood all over their bedroom. This is true. I hadn't thought that argument through properly. Bravo, Nathan. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the police section is... I mean, Charles Durning's character is... What I like about that section is he's less of a policeman. He's more of, of this kind of obsessed man seeking revenge. So he's kind of like a Loomis character rather than a detective. So the, the police investigation stuff is, is minimal, thankfully, because I, I often find it gets in the way sometimes and slows down the narrative of, of films like this. Um so to me, the, the the whole film feels kind of more like those maniac-focused uh, slasher movies that were popular around 1979, 1980. So things like Christmas Evil, Maniac, Don't Answer the Phone. Uh, obviously, this is a, like a, a PG-rated version of those type of films, but that's the kind of vibe I got from it. Um, maybe it probably it's probably closer to something like He Knows You're Alone, that type of film. 
Um, and back in the day, they just weren't my cup of tea at all because I wanted masked silent killers, you know, attacking teenagers in the woods. And this didn't deliver on that. Uh, but I've warmed them more in recent years. And I really like things like uh, like Christmas Evil certainly has grown on me a lot and uh, Maniac as well. Um, I do think there's one brilliant scare in the film that equals anything it's in in Black Christmas, for example. That, and that is that scene you mentioned where Carol Kane hears the voices coming from the closet and she wakes up to find that her husband with Hugh Jaffro is not there, but it's actually the killer in the bed next to her. I thought that was really well well done and uh, it really sort of brought the climax of the film to life and gave it something really memorable. So overall i would say that for me when a stranger calls i think is a good film not a great one never been one of my favorites um as you said i think if it had more cohesion to it it might uh you know rank higher in my list of uh slasher movies but uh no i did enjoy rewatching it this was the first time i'd seen it in a very long time and i did enjoy rewatching it so that's my tuppence Okay, well, thank you. I do think you know. Thinking back, is that if they had like even just a couple of scenes of Carol Kane, um, uh, Charles Durning kind of calling her and saying he's escaped from the asylum, and her looking at a phone or something, and just kind of it, it may have just kept that you know that kind of uh, cohesion or that structure throughout that may have linked it up a little, little bit better. It felt to me like the like one of those kind of uh, low budget films that's shot over a couple of years and it it has that kind of piecemeal feel to it like it's almost as if they filmed the first part i know it's based on the short film that um fred walton did but the first part feels like it might have been shot a few few years earlier and then they said oh let's stretch this to feature length and go out and shoot some more footage yeah no it is a a kind of strange approach but um thank you eric Uh, joseph how about you yeah um when a stranger calls i i think this movie gets entirely too much flack for its middle portion, which honestly I found mostly riveting, though I get it. I mean, if you're looking for an extension of that opening sequence or, you know, something along the lines of Friday the 13th, that sort of style, you're bound to be disappointed. Um, For me, I found it quite an eye-opening indictment of something like xenophobia and how we allow certain things to slip through the cracks because of our collective fear of others. I mean, the Kurt Duncan character, he's, 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 he's a curious one in how he embodies all of that. And I mean, I actually felt a twinge of sympathy for him, even though he's done this terrible thing in the opening sequence. Um, that opening sequence, by the way, I, I always remember it being the film's selling point. And yeah, it does sustain tension, even though we've seen the conceit done better elsewhere. Eric mentioned Black Christmas, obviously. Um, but I think the middle portion of the film, watching it this time around, it really took me by surprise. I mean, there's a sort of ticking time bomb aspect to the Kirk character in so much that we don't know if he's going to kill again, if he's going to repent or for what he's done, or if he's simply going to be locked away and forgotten about. Um, which he is, you know, for the the first uh, 20 minutes after he's, you know, initially caught. And I think actor Tony Beckley does such a wonderful job of making you question um, what path he what path he may be led down. Uh, the supporting turns from Carol Kane and especially Colleen Dewhurst, you know, I think they g- it gives the film more dimension than the simple plot would seemingly allow. Though I felt that more often than not, we'd, we'd sort of peer into their lives or into the lives of these characters. And just as we're getting to the good stuff, we'd kind of move away or we'd never see them again, which I, th- you know, I, f- I found a little disappointing. Um, overall, though, I think When a Stranger Calls was a lot better in full than I remembered. I mean, I didn't find it boring or uninvolving past its um, opening sequence. Um, though I suppose I can say I was maybe too wrapped up as I just, as I wanted just a little more than the film was able to, um, you know, able to offer. It just feels like a movie that's teetering on the brink of greatness, but it's, I don't know, it stopped just short for whatever reason. Still recommended viewing, especially in context of what it did at the time and how it's connected to our beloved subgenre. Um, I don't consider it a slasher film personally, but I can see why it's lumped in with that, that kind of mold that that kind of set there um but overall thumbs up for me okay well thank you i i think it's kind of interesting that uh i mean uh my understanding is that fred walton uh, made this uh made this movie well the, the short movie the sitter in 1977 
uh, with his kind of writing bar- partner is, uh, is uh, Steve Fake or Fake. Um, uh, if I got his name right, which I haven't got in front of me. Uh, yes, it's Steve Fake who went on to write, incidentally, went on to write the classic Mac and Me. Um, which is scary for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, so, um, but I think he kind of, my understanding is that, I mean, they, they did the sitter as a calling card uh, for the major studios. Because it's actually, I mean, not the, you know, if you, uh, it's on, I think it's on the Blu-ray that was released recently and uh, it's on YouTube if you did want to check it out. Um, so it's kind of like a shot for shot, um, more or less. Although the only difference is, is Mrs. Mandrakis is a real bitch in the sitter whereas return your older isn't in the um the actual film uh and the the babysitter who's played by a completely different sort of uh, sort of uh well different completely different actress obviously uh she um she responds to being called by the uh by the, the killer upstairs raiding the bar and they're very impressive bar so he keeps on pouring himself the biggest shots of whiskey that i've ever seen in my life which is probably what i would do if i had phone calls from a maniac is uh pour myself a, a stiff one um but uh but yeah so it's very it's very very similar um uh, you know right down to the dialogues almost exactly same beat for beat I, it's kind of uh so um i mean my understanding I, you know before we go into the background was that to say this was kind of a sort of kind of calling card uh, to get into Hollywood, and um, I, yeah, I'm old enough to remember. I don't know if you, you, I did. Were there kind of second features still a thing when you were going to this, 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 the cinema, like the short film before the main feature? Yes, for me they were. Yeah, yeah, for me they definitely were in the se- late seventies, early eighties, or the kids' movies anyway that I went to see. I'd, what about you guys in the states? Did you have short films before the main feature? Yeah, we we did, but they kind of teetered out like around eighty four, eighty five. They that the theaters just wasn't wasn't going to pay like a, you know, a secondary fee on a on a, on something they didn't you know consider a feature. So they they stopped doing that altogether. Yeah, well, that's why I because because I can remember very much that kind of the second feature, and it would usually be a short movie of of some kind, and quite often we have like absolutely not even sharing a genre with the main feature. Um, but uh, I think they they thought that they could sell this, and there's a kind of calling card to major studios as a kind of supporting short. Um, but uh, they soon found out that that wasn't the case. Surprisingly, I thought back then they, that would have been the case. But um, um, I mean, I've got quite a lot of background on this, and certainly kind of tangentially some of the things, some of the inspiration for this movie. But uh, I don't know if you guys would like to go first and see if there's anything you wanted to throw into the into the hat. You mentioned that uh, Dr. Mandrakis' wife is really rude in The Sitter, but um, I always thought that Jill's friend, Nancy, uh, that she's talking to on the phone in When a Stranger Calls is extremely rude to somebody that's supposed to be her friend, mm. but in The Sitter, like, you know, she's she's not. Like, she actually does seem like a decent friend. They kind of change that around, too. Mm. And also, did you notice that the in the house the the carpet is is it's actually set in 1972, which again is the um, when a stranger calls the opening sequence is supposed to be set in 1972, but in the sitter the carpet is the most garish um, kind of blood red, and I was just thinking that that's a perfect for a murder scene, isn't it? If you didn't want to leave a stain, it's like the whole house is just covered in plush blood red carpet. And you know. Oh. I will say that sounds though, like heaven to me. I would love <laughs> to live in that house. Um, I actually preferred the house they used in the sitter. Just my opinion. I think it's because there's these huge windows and there's a lot of shots from the sitter that are, are done from outside. So it's kind of making you think the killer's looking, you know, from outside in into the house. So mm-hmm. I, I just I loved that. That wasn't really in the when a stranger calls you know not really one thing one thing i like about um when a stranger calls is when we get shots of um the 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 kurt character wandering through the city i love how the city looked back then those old rundown bars that nightlife that was going on at the time it's just so kind of you know 42nd street looking it's just grimy and dirty looking no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's definitely that kind of around that time with all those those kind of other films like uh, sort of uh, Nightmares and Damaged Brain and the Forty Second Street looking very grimy. It was very much that late seventies look, wasn't it? Everything kind of beige and concrete and depressing and lots of fumes from cars and everything. It's kind of it's, it makes you strangely nostalgic. For those times. <laughs> yeah, I don't find it depressing at all. I no. would I would go back and never turn back. I would yeah. you know just say goodbye to all of it and go live there. Yeah, paint everything brown and beige and the blood red carpet and then uh, yep. a massive bar. 
um, all sounds good to Absolutely, me. Absolutely, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, Nathan, do you have anything else you want to, um, uh, any background you want to uh, clue us into? I don't have any background, but mm. when the time comes, I can discuss the sequel and the remakes. I watched both of them. Excellent. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that. So we'll do that at the end of the uh, the uh, the background, if that's okay. Um, so, but uh, Joseph, how about you? I didn't really dig up anything because I've been so busy editing a lot of our shows. But um, I watched a few of the TV spots that were out at the time, and um, I watched the audience reaction, which I think you put in the opening uh, little clip there. Yeah. Um, of the audience reaction, and I I got a kick out of the theater because they're all just sitting in folding chairs, which is totally not like the theaters you see today. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't really have any background per se. No. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Eric. How about you? Um. Uh, yeah. What? No. No. <laughs> well, that's okay. Um, I've I've dug up a few things. Is they say so just a little bit extra on the on the sitter. Uh, it was a shot on thirty five mil, which is quite unusual, I think, probably for like short movies back then, because um, a lot of low budget horror movies were shot on eight mil or sixteen mil, um, and then blown up uh, for cinema um, distribution. And it was shot for twenty five thousand dollars in May of nineteen seventy seven, um, but they wanted it very much to be a commercial movie, not too artsy, uh, and they shopped it around to studio executives who showed no interest particularly for it. But they were they were lucky in that they they actually booked it. I don't know if they paid to put it in, but they booked into Man's Village Theatre, which I'm presuming that's in New York. I don't know if that's in Los Angeles or New York, but anyway, it was uh, played uh, second feature or the short movie before uh, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, um, which uh, star- starred Richard Gere. And coincidentally, his um, agent came in to sort of see how the audience were react- reacting to Richard Gere being in Looking for Mr. Goodbar. Uh, and he was intrigued by when a strange, well, the, by the sitter. Uh, so got in contact with uh, the um, uh, with uh, Fred Walton and Steve Feck and asked them, uh, asked them if they would be interested in developing it into a feature. And so got backing and that's what happened. And then obviously then it got picked up uh, by Columbia. Uh, I think it was on a budget of 1.5 million and ended up grossing 20 million. Uh, so it's, as I said before, there was this kind of people said that um, it was influenced by Halloween. But in fact, uh, there's a Los Angeles LA Times article uh, with Fred Walton talking about making the movie and it said it started shooting at the beginning of October of 1978 and Halloween went into a kind of regional sort of roll, slow rollout in the same month of the same year. So in no way was it influenced, but where it was influenced was in its marketing. Um, so uh, by the time it got released in 1979, um, the, in uh, September 28th, 1979, so on, on the kind of wide release through the October of that year of obviously the, the Halloween season, it was very much pushed by Columbia, uh, where they essentially gave away the the you know the opening sequence to the movie, but the calls are coming from inside the house. Uh, so it was very much designed to get people thinking it was very much along in the Halloween um, uh, sort of uh, style, which I th- where I think it potentially came a cropper in some ways because uh, it didn't quite live up to what people were expecting, and obviously. Um, you know, Fred Walton had no idea that Halloween would be such a big success. I think I kind of get the impression he he was more interested in making a film, uh, taking some of the more dramatic bits out of films like The Exorcist or, um, uh, you know, some of those kind of 70s uh, cop thrillers, um, you know, like The French Connection or something like that, just to sort of do more of a kind of gritty um, manhunt type thing in the, in the movie. Um, so... Uh, but interestingly enough, I mean, t- digging into things now, have you guys heard of another short movie called Foster's Release, also known as Judson's Release? I no. can't say I've no. ever heard of that. No. Well, interestingly enough, and this is probably on one of my most wanted lists. So if anyone can hook us up to a copy of this, I'd be very, very, uh, very, very um uh, grateful indeed. Um, it's a short film that was uh, partially uh, inspired by um, the what is supposed was thought to be the kind of the um, the origin story for the whole urban legend of the calls coming from inside the house, which was a 1950 
true murder, uh, true crime um, murder of a babysitter called Janet Christman or Christman um, in 1950, which I think it still went unsolved where a babysitter was murdered and she tried to phone the police for help. Uh, but the baby, the three-year-old that she was babysitting was left um, un, un, well, uh, unharmed. Um, now, Foster's release um, was a kind of, I think it was a student film, where the um, where it's basically it has a babysitter being um, menaced by uh, an escaped lunatic, played funnily enough, well, funny enough, but incidentally by Dan O'Bannon who uh, are obviously involved with um, uh, Alien and uh, various other genre films throughout the late 70s and early 1980s. Uh, and this has been seen as very much uh, an influence on the opening of When a Stranger Calls, Black Christmas, uh, and any other movie that has a kind of babysitter in in peril. Now, the reason it's not very well known, it was released um, uh, with a compilation of uh, short movies by other people, including John Carpenter. Uh, I think it's called Shock Value, the movie. Uh, and it had some limited cinema um, uh, showings 10 years ago where they showed um, basically about six or seven short student movies, uh, kind of genre uh, student movies, and Foster's release was one of them. Um, apparently, John Camper's movie, uh, short film, which I can't remember the name of, um, utilised uh, maybe it's some Beatles music or something which they couldn't get clearance for. So it's never been released anywhere else onto onto home any kind of home media. So I know some people have seen it, but it's not been seen. But this is supposed to be like the granddaddy of the um, the babysitter menace babysitter, which obviously went on to influence. Um, oh, arguably it's said to influence, but of course how these people would have seen it is another matter. Now, another film, which um, I think was a kind of an influence on it, we talked about Black Christmas, which of course also utilised the the whole thing of the, the course coming from inside the house. But there's the other movie, which is Fright from 1971 with Susan George um, as a babysitter being menaced by an escape um, escapee from a lunatic asylum, which have, have you guys seen Fright? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, I've seen that one. No. No, no. Well, that's one we might cover at some point, but that's kind of, uh, again, it's um, <clears throat> in the same way you've got that Joan Collins one with uh, Tales from the Crypt um, and All Through the House with the Killer Santa. These are kind of films that may be planted a seed in the heads of filmmakers going forward. So uh, I thought that was um, sort of uh, uh, quite interesting. So now the 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 actual film itself, um, as I mentioned, it's on IMDb. It said it was shot from June to August 1978. But I think anyone um, viewing this, because it, it was shot uh, in Los, in around Los Angeles um, and Brentwood, and I very much uh, doubt that Los Angeles would have looked um, would have looked as cold and grey in the summer of 1978 as it does and of course it was actually shot from in october through um uh, through november of 1978 um so, uh, so it took 27 and a half days to shoot the whole thing uh carol kane was originally um didn't want to do the park she didn't uh, thought it was too violent um but then she said she read the script and she was so terrified by the script she said uh, she had to sleep at a friend's house the night before so uh, she so she was interested uh in doing that um the um tony beckley who played kurt duncan uh died in april of 1980 so only six months after the film's premiere um and in fact actually the sequel uh, when a stranger calls back was dedicated to his memory um apparently there was some kind of um uh, kind of strangeness on the set with tony beckley and carol kane he was kind of became a bit obsessed with her and uh thought he wasn't up to her acting standards even though in reality uh they only share one scene together right at the end of the movie so how much of that was kind of press ballyhoo or something I, i'm not sure um so, uh, as I mentioned, it got picked up by Columbia, who incidentally, of course, released Happy Birthday to Me uh, a couple of years later after the success of Friday the 13th. Um, and um, I think I mentioned, obviously mentioned about the true crime, uh, it's, it's, uh, the case that was supposedly um, had uh, kind of inspired it. Interesting, the last thing I was going to mention was that Dan Gaia or Gear, who was an American film critic at the time, um, who really, really hated slasher movies, uh, he went on to refuse to review them. So he wouldn't review The Burning. He would just kind of, he would just like have a blanket thing of not reviewing them. He actually gave When a Stranger Calls a kind of positive review. Uh, and in, in his review at the time, he said it was based on uh, a newspaper article from uh, a real 
Whole Life case in Santa Monica in 1972 of a babysitter being menaced by telephone calls. Now, Inci- inci- well, um, I, I don't know if it's coincidentally, the uh, the sitter starts to saying that the that set in Santa Monica in 1972. So perhaps he was confusing them. Um, but our old, lastly, I'll say our old friends Siskel and Ebert um, didn't give it the film a good review. Uh, they went on to uh, they kind of lumped this in and Silent Scream, which was another movie that kind of came out in the wake of Halloween, which was filmed before Halloween uh, was made, but happened to kind of ride on its coattails somewhat. Um, they kind of said it was another movie where women were menaced by murderers. Uh, and it was an anti-women movie, which is plainly ridiculous, but it was kind of... Uh, uh, so otherwise, some of the um, the reviews of it were pretty good. Uh, and uh, obviously, it also kind of helped pave the way for, um, as we talked about actually in the Friday 13th commentary, about how uh, this was a directly inspired Paramount to pick up Friday 13th, another independently produced horror movie, uh, because of the success for Columbia of this movie, and so sort of making 20 million on a 1.5 million dollar budget. So, uh, so yeah. So, um, but Nathan, I, I haven't had a chance to rewatch When a Stranger Calls, and I haven't seen the remake for a number of years. Although I do remember the remake does what this film doesn't do, which is basically stretch the first 20 minutes over 90 minutes, isn't it? If I remember correctly. Yes, that's that's how the remake does it. And I I'm maybe in the minority, but I love the remake. I think it's awesome. It's not particularly scary, but I just I find it so entertaining um, from beginning to end. Like I love the setting, like the house and everything. Um, I just find it to be a really fun movie. So I'm really glad I rewatched it. And Straps is glad, too. She sounds it. Yeah, she's very happy that we rewatched uh, When a Stranger Calls remake. Do, have any of you guys watched it? Did any of you watch it in preparation for this movie? Not in preparation. I did see it when it came out in the cinema, and I remember it being okay at best. Is it? It's all set in it. The house is all glass or something, is it, from what I remember? Yeah, pretty much. Mm. Um, yeah, I remember it being okay. I would, I'd need to rewatch it. I haven't seen the sequel, though. I've never seen When a Stranger Calls back. Ooh, I love Ooh. When a Stranger Calls Back. I think it's better than When a Stranger Calls, if I can be controversial here. Mm. Well, I'd like to pick it at some point. I haven't seen it for a long time, but I do remember. And it's got a fantastic uh, scene with some wallpaper, I seem to remember. Yes. After the babysitter opening, uh, they do follow the killer, but they also follow the victim, like Jill Shulin. Uh, they follow her and show, I guess, the effects that this has had on her. And I just thought that was a smart decision. It didn't feel like, it didn't feel as disjointed for me as uh, the first one does. And Stripes agrees. Yes, very vocal. She wants up on this desk so bad she can't stand it. <laughs> I know. Well, that's what happened last time when we were recording. My uh, One of my pussies got on, on and knocked the <laughs> microphone out. So uh, I feel your pain. So when a stranger calls back is obviously a different stranger, yes? The only connection really is Carol Kane and Charles Durning are in it. Like Carol Kane shows up to kind of help the teenager because she'd been through something similar herself. So she's kind of like a, I think she's like a counselor. Um, so she helps. And, and I feel like when a stranger calls back, one thing they didn't really do much in when a stranger calls is I didn't feel like Carol Kane had a lot to do even at the end. I mean, she didn't really have much to do, but in the sequel, she, uh, is much more proactive. Like, you know, she takes self-defense. She carries a gun. I mean, she, um, is, I guess, tougher in the sequel, um, which I think really worked, especially, I guess, after all she'd went through in the first one. It's kind of interesting as it's almost like an inspiration or sort of uh, for the character, Neve Campbell's character in Scream, where she kind of goes down a kind of similar route, doesn't she? It's for that kind of becoming kind of tougher as, as the sequels go on. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think I remember really liking that movie. So I'd, yeah, I'd love to cover it again quite soon on the show. I think it would be uh, interesting to re- revisit it. Yeah, I think it'd be a really good pick. So definitely. Cool. Excellent. Well, um, what was the consensus on the group, Joseph? Uh, 31 comments for When a Stranger Calls. Um, Dave Felter says, high grade stuff. A slasher you won't feel guilty about loving when you wake up the next day. By the way, the middle segment is just fine. And I agree with him there. Uh, Yvette K. 
Kellier writes, The beginning and the end are amazingly suspenseful. The middle is just a depressing bummer. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Listen on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and about a billion other podcatchers, both good and bad. We're also on Patreon, and by the time you've heard this episode, as we mentioned before, our inaugural Friday the 13th commentary track will have dropped, and we're heading toward Disco Death with Prom Night. So, um, in the interim, feedback and requests for a Hollywood's New Blood commentary track can be sent to the Hysteria Ugh. Continues at gmail.com. <laughs> Well, talking of depressing bummers. It's my joke of the week. It's so, so and fantastic. Did you hear about the film where Yogi Bear gets calls telling him to check his picnic basket? It was called When a Ranger Calls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Eric, that I had to get three sad trombones. <laughs> hey, boo-boo, have you checked the children? Joseph liked it. Uh, well, let's not start sucking our own dicks here, Eric. <laughs> <sighs> okay. And um, we do have some feedback, don't we? I don't know, do we? Well, you sent me some. Okay. Well, I'll read it out. So, hello, guys. I wanted to write in a quick note uh, to tell you how much I've been enjoying the Patreon top threes. And I may be controversial here, but as far as Susie versus Toya... Dot, dot, dot. I like them both. To be fair, I knew Susie before listening to the podcast all the way, all the way back in 2013, thanks to a goth punk older sister playing the Banshees constantly, and only discovered Toya through the podcast. Although I had seen Erg, Erg, A Music War. Is that something she was in? Um, She was in a film called Erg, uh, yeah. It was ah, uh, yeah. British horror film. A lot of the film. punk bands, or, or, no, no, it was a lot of the oh. punk bands at the time, wasn't it? Um, like Fear and X and all those kind of. Uh, Let me see. Continue talking, and I will Google it. Yeah, it's a lot of nineteen seventy, late seventies, early eighties punk bands. It's like a documentary, I believe. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I think that's what he's talking about. Right. It says I find Toy in the same league as Missing Persons or Kate Bush. Dot, dot, dot. Does that make sense? Question mark. Anyway, she's, I think... She's good, very good friends with Kate Bush. Is she? Yeah. Oh. When Kate Bush was doing her um, tour uh, about eight years ago, when she was doing that residency in London, she rang Toya to ask her for advice. So there. I don't mind Kate Bush, but um, a lot of... I can have some of the stuff I, I quite liked in the 80s, but... Um, uh, she does sound like uh, um, someone jumping on a, a bag full of squirrels. I love Kate Bush. Mm. So uh, yeah, I think you know, I, you know, I, I don't want to alienate a lot of people. I, I, I would never use the term self-indulgent with Kate Bush, just to make that clear. So <gasps> anyway, goes on I think to, you would. I mm. think you would. <laughs> anyway, I think there's room for both trailblazing ladies in rock music. Okay, on to my question. Have you guys ever thought of covering Pete Walker movies? These are films I didn't even know existed until I heard Justin bring them up on the podcast. And now I consider myself a super fan. There are several of his movies that would be perfect for the main show. So I'd love to hear you cover them. Now, I think we have covered Frightmare, haven't we? Well, we did a commentary for um, the other Frightmare, but we've never done a Pete Walker film. Hmm. Okay, well. So yeah, I mean we're we're far removed from Pete Walker, which is a shame because you know, I've I like every one of his movies. I think we may have covered it on some of the top 3s when we did the 70s. Mm. We probably did some of that, yeah. so maybe that's what I'm thinking. So, it goes on as always. Thank you for the quality entertainment over the years. You guys uh, really make my week when you drop a new episode, Q Cat Flush, uh, with regards, Lou from Boston. So thank you, Lou, uh, for writing in. And uh, so calm has been restored in the, this. I think there's a truce with the Susie versus Toya. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> like that's going to happen. Yeah. I can confirm, yes, there, yeah, that film Erg, a music war, uh, Toya's in that uh, doing the song Danced, which is brilliant. I must admit today, talking about Toya, I did say, um, the, you know, the AI art generator. Yeah. I did type into that Toya fighting Jason Voorhees. And? It, it came up with some stuff and it's, it was just two Jason Voorhees fighting. But I did, um, you put in, I did put Toya Witch in and that's where I got that photo, that image I sent to you, Eric. Oh. Mm. <laughs> well, I need to find out what this AI uh, art thing is so I can do reciprocal ones about Susie. 
Oh God, this is going to be like that reface thing he was obsessed with for like ever. Now he's yeah. going to be obsessed with this. Yeah, well, it does. Funny enough, it actually was a, t- a toy. They don't look too bad. The Suzy ones look a bit sort of um, look like detox, more like share doing deto- uh, d- detox doing share rather than Suzy. But anyway, so but it's funny you can put in all sorts of things. Like I did kittens um, ice skating. So anyway, it's um, moments of fun. So uh, yeah, any any other feedback? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, um, we're just about to go and record our flashback fango to episode oh, uh, issue 23, uh, covering the Evil Dead, the Incubus. What else is in that one? Uh, uh, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. The last horror film, the Carolyn Monroe, Joe Spinell um, rematch. So, yeah, that's going to be a fun one to talk about. So, uh, And what are we covering next time? Yes, my pick next time, and we are going to do the very last, uh, well, uh, so far, um, Elm Street movie, which is the Nightmare on Elm Street remake from 2010, I think it was. Okay. So brace yourselves. I've mm-hmm. never seen it, never seen it, so I don't know whether to look forward to it or not, but I, I have no <laughs> choice, I guess. No. So, uh, okay, well, that'll be interesting. So, um, okay, well, I think we'll play out with, I know it's a very obvious choice, but we'll go out with Hanging on the Telephone by Blondie. Oh, I love that song. Yeah. And, oh, good choice. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, yeah, so we'll catch you next time on Hysteria Continues. So thank you for listening and say goodbye to the good people. I'd say goodbye, but I'm in the phone booth. That's the one outside the hall. <laughs> Is it ringing off the wall? Yeah. Okay, well, goodbye anyway. Bye. You whore. Back right up, whore. Bye. I'm in the fumble. It's a one across.